My name is Brian Doak, and this is George Fox Talks Theology. As you know, on the Theology Channel during the season, we are bringing you live events from the campus of George Fox University here in beautiful Newburgh, Oregon, and today is no different. You're going to get a lecture from a class called Theo 101, The Bible, and the students are taking a journey through the Bible, and every Friday there is a lecture called The Bible and fill in the blank on some topic that's pertinent to those week's readings. In this week of the class, they were reading the books of Joshua and Judges, in which the instructors for the class um, were, were, were very much concerned to give the students some kind of framework around the idea of the Bible and violence. And this is a really hard topic, um, certainly to study and to learn about, um, and also to speak about, as I know, because I was the speaker for this particular um, week in the class. Um, the only thing I guess to know beforehand is that this is a live audience of, of mostly freshmen, and so and this is and this is a class. So the material that we delivered had to work, you know, with the class and with the people who are there. Um, but also, we just thought, why not give it to you all to consider um, here on the podcast? So you can drop me an email if you want. Let me know if if this consideration of the Bible and violence is is helpful for reading scripture um, for the life of faith, or if or if you'd have done it differently. Drop me a note. All right, enjoy. <music> The topic we're discussing today is a fairly heavy one, right? It's fairly weighty. And so this is something that hopefully you are mentally and emotionally prepared as you come into this space. Um, but if you find at any moment that you just need to take a step out uh, because of the topics that we're discussing, please feel the freedom to do that as well. Because it is, we want to be sensitive to one another and gracious to our colleagues uh, in this space as we dive into difficult conversations. But this is also something, an invitation to dive into challenging topics and concerns and questions that the Bible raises and that the Bible, it's in there. So we got to talk about these things. So for our topic today on the Bible and violence, we've invited Dr. Brian Doak. Brian is the vice president of George Fox Digital. So if you ever take a GFD course, he has some sort of hand in that at some point, I'm assuming. He oversees all these guys who are doing all the filming over here. He is also a professor of biblical studies, a professor of Hebrew Bible. He's been here at George Fox for 11 years, 12 years? 11 years, over a decade. He is a friend and a scholar and a gentleman and an excellent trail runner. Uh, he also uh, co-hosts a podcast called Weird Religion with another faculty member here at George Fox, Dr. Leah Payne. Google Weird Religion, find that podcast, listen to it. It's amazing. They talk about pop culture, religion, all sorts of awesome stuff there. Without further ado, give it up for Dr. Brian Doak. Has that thing ever happened to you when you're watching Netflix, like a TV show, and right at the most grotesque, objectionable scene, your mom walks in the door, and you're like, ha! Huh. Like, oh, mom, hi. This whole show isn't like this, I just wanted to explain. Also, I didn't write the show. Also, it's art. Like, I don't know, mom, like what, I, like you, you know. Some shows are like this, right? Um, it's also the case, I think, I thought of that analogy because I think that violence in the Bible is sometimes like this. Like the whole Bible isn't just beginning to end full of horrible, gruesome scenes of violence and sex, but like it comes up often enough that if you just opened to a page, you might well open to a page on which something truly strange is happening. Um, and because of this, and because in, in particular of some of the materials that you were asked to read for this week, dealing with violence, even sexual violence, war violence, other kinds of, of truly difficult things, we want to talk about it together. So um, here's the single basic question that I want to, that I want to ask that that could occupy the rest of our time together. How do faithful, smart, realistic people deal with this in the Bible? How do faithful, smart, and realistic people such that I know you all are and want to be and that I want to be, how do we deal with this? What kind of things are we talking about, by the way? I mean, yeah, there are wars and people kill each other, I get it, but like, what kinds of examples do I mean that truly like push this to the level that we feel like we have to explain it, that we have to somehow justify it, that we have to understand it? Here are three examples, more or less off the top of my head, but uh, two of which come from your readings for today and one's a little beyond that. And there are a lot of examples that could have been chosen. One is this institution um, of the so-called harem, harem, or harem if you don't want to say it like in Hebrew, 
and it's a type of ancient Near Eastern warfare practice. It might be a relief to know that ancient Israel didn't actually invent this type of warfare, but rather it was apparently, um, we know from archaeology and inscriptions and in other, uh, from other places, a type of warfare that was practiced in the world generally. And it goes like this. this is, these are the rules of the harem, or sometimes it's translated as ban or total annihilation. You go into a city and you kill literally everyone in the city. Not just the soldiers, but also mamas and babies and grandparents. You kill the old and the young. You kill the dogs and you kill the pets and you kill the cats and you kill the donkeys and the horses. And literally, as scripture puts it several times, everything that breathes dies. This is the type of warfare, by the way, that Israel is commanded to carry out on the so-called Canaanites, the people who live in the land that Israel is supposed to take in Deuteronomy chapter 20, if you want to look that up and read it later, has kind of like rules around it about who gets the harem and who doesn't, who dies and who lives, and it's, it's pretty wild stuff. I mean, just to imagine trying to practice a type of warfare like that, and then to imagine it's something that God commands Israel to do. It's pretty dramatic. And then, in Joshua chapter 6, which is something I, I think you did read for this week, Israel actually carries this out and is, and is commanded to carry this out on a, on a number of cities, like Jericho and Ai, and then a bunch of places listed in, in Joshua chapter 12. So that's one example, okay? How about another example? Judges chapter 19. This is a story that was kind of you know, skipped over from the book of Judges. It's not exactly introductory reading, but I'll, I'll, I'll recap the story for you if it's something you want to try to read, dare to read, you can, you can do it. I noticed, I watched with you your Bible project video for this week on Judges. I noticed that they skipped the story, and actually censored it on the screen and said, yeah, this is kind of a terrible story. We won't even talk about it next. <laughs> and granted, they don't have time to do everything, but I saw that they did do that, and they did for good reason. The story in Judges 19 involves a Levite who's a religious professional in Israel of sorts. He's kind of like a priest or someone who could become a priest, let's say. And he has not really a wife. She's called a concubine. I don't know why they'd call her a concubine. A concubine is kind of like a sexual partner, I guess, who's not your wife. But then later in the story, they do call her his wife, or they call him her husband. So it's kind of confusing about whether they're married or not. But at any rate, at any rate they use this old-fashioned term concubine for her. And she's not named. She's given no name. And he's sort of wandering around the countryside with her and gets taken in by an old man. And some people in this city bang on their door at night and sort of demand that uh, the people of this house come out and or that this this mob, I guess, gets to come in and have sex with the people in the house. And the owner of the house is like, no, 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 no. Um, I don't want you to have to do this. And, and just in case you think I'm making this up, I'm going to turn actually to the passage here. I've got the text um, in front of me. He invites them in, and the people surround the house. And, and the old man says, no, no, no. This is in uh, Judges chapter 19. He says, don't act so wickedly. Since this man is my guest, do not do this vile thing. That is to say, do not ask him to come out of the house and have sex with you. This would be weird. This would be bad, he says. Here's my virgin daughter and his concubine. Let me bring them out to you now. Ravish them and do whatever you want to them. But against this man, do not do such a vile thing. Which seems super cowardly, the idea that you'd send two vulnerable women out to a, like a, a sexually violent mob rather than your own self, or however that's supposed to work. And he ends up sort of trying to do this, but the crowd says no, and they end up throwing the concubine out there, and she's abused and eventually killed. And then after that, as if that's not bad enough, she's actually dismembered, and her body parts are mailed throughout all of Israel by her husband or the Levite in order to say, look at how crazy these people are. Isn't this terrible? And everyone agrees that it is truly terrible, and the book ends on a haunting note which is that there is no king in Israel and that everyone does whatever the heck they want. That's my paraphrase. Okay, great. Like, that's, the, that's in the Bible? Yeah, that's in the Bible. There's a story like that in a truly difficult book. Lots of other examples, too, that occur throughout the Old Testament. Um, for example, there's a psalm. I mean, what about the psalms? Are the, are the psalms safe from this kind of violence? This is like beautiful, pour your, heart out, pour your heart out to God type literature. You know, this is just like me and God, my private Jesus time. It's beautiful. These are worship lyrics. Yeah, there's a psalm, uh, psalm, psalm 137. It's not the only psalm like this, but this one I thought was particularly fascinating on this front. It's kind of sad. It's kind of beautiful. The author is like, ah, I'm away from my home. I'm in a foreign land. It's terrible. God, I don't want to forget you. Help me, God. By the way, 
the psalmist says, my enemies who did this to me, I really hope you enact judgment against them. In fact, I hope that you judge them so hard, and I'm going to actually read this from the Bible so I don't get the quote wrong. I had it marked. Oh, here it is. Remember, O Lord, against the Edomites, how they said all this stuff. You know, pay them back. Here's the last verse. Happy shall they be who take your little ones and dash them against the rock. Which is kind of like a biblical idiom for saying, it would be great if someone killed your kids. Like, I hope someone kills your, kills your little kids. It's basically how the psalm ends. It ends on that note, right? The author wishes something like that would happen. Okay, okay, okay. This is all truly gruesome. But thank God for the New Testament, right? Thank God for Jesus. The problems go away. Not exactly. Not exactly. You can't get out of it that easily. Jesus himself dies, as you may know. This is a bit of a plot spoiler, but Jesus dies a gruesome, violent death. It's a troubling narrative of innocent victimhood on a cross. By the way, hell, which is a, a traditional theological concept that Christians have held in some form or another since the very beginning, in fact, was also uh, talked about by Jesus like Mark 9, for example, Jesus says there'll be an unquenchable fire with worms eating people's eyes out in some kind of horrible afterlife. This is drawn from imagery in Isaiah 66, where roughly the same picture of punishment is. So you have this concept of hell, which is not exactly nonviolent. I mean, is it nonviolent to be burning in an unquenchable fire and have your eyes eaten out by worms? So that's, that's rough. Might seem like justice. It might be justice, but it is dark. There are other images of Jesus, too. I mean, you have the images of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, preaching about love for enemies and so on. But the book of Revelation, which is also a biblical true picture of Jesus in the Bible, this is the last book in the Bible. It's a very famous book, but it's, it's a troubling book. Has Jesus, come, has Jesus coming back, coming back to the scene, riding on a horse, wearing a robe dipped in blood, and with a sword coming out of his mouth in order to slay the nations? Okay. So this is, this is an image of Jesus that comes in Revelation 19. These examples could be multiplied, but the ethical problems they represent, I want to submit to you, cannot be avoided by thoughtful, faithful people. So we have to get into it. How do faithful, smart, realistic people deal with this kind of stuff? I have four ideas. Could really end up being five ideas. Could be three ideas. Let's go for four ideas, okay? You look like a four-idea kind of crowd there staring at me with totally indiscernible faces right now. Um, so I'm going to do four ideas uh, for how I think this could work with some embedded examples in here. And then I want to open this topic up to conversation with you all in any direction that you want. I'll turn it over to Dr. Mayward to kind of moderate that. You can, of course, text them to the text thing, or maybe there can be a microphone running around, or we can just see how we feel, okay? Okay, here's idea number one. In a lot of ways, I think, in our world, violence feels natural. It feels like a normal, eternal part of the world order. Um, and you could come up with, a, you could have a worldview, you could potentially have a worldview in which you see violence as a foundational principle of what it means to just be alive, right? Violence is normal, it's natural, it's eternal. In fact, there were ancient storytelling traditions that were even um, contemporary with the Bible that enshrined a belief something like this. Like there's an ancient Babylonian creation story that people often talk about. It's called the Enuma Elish. It was probably something that circulated in the biblical world at the same time as the biblical creation story did and that it was written down. It was from ancient Babylonia, which is like today, modern day Iraq, Middle East, kind of that area, if you think of ancient Babylonia. And in that story, cre uh, violence is like a primal foundational principle of being. It occurs really fast in the story. And in fact, the kind of moral order of the cosmos is predicated on violence, on murder. Murder as a solution to a problem, and then like more murder to murder the murderers to, to, to create a new political order, okay? So you could do that. You could do it uh, from that kind of route, and we know that there were things like that. You could also do it from a purely materialist kind of route. Like you could just be like, yeah, there's no God. There's just entropy. The universe is falling apart. Bodies in space are clashing into each other. My roommate and I hate each other. Like this is just life. Like this is just the way that it is. We play violence out in drama on TV. We watch violence enacted. Maybe, maybe we think, ah, war is terrible, but we like to watch sort of representational war. Like, I think, like, I'm not a huge football fan. I'm a little bit, I'm like a half football fan. So if you are a football fan, perhaps you can relate. And if not, you can identify with the half of me that's not really a fan. But like, I happened just randomly to tune into a football game last night, which I really do. I turn it on and some person has just been like gruesomely injured on live TV. And then this guy who's gruesomely injured, like you thought for a second maybe he was dead. Like he's gruesomely injured and he's, he, he had a brain injury. 
And the brain injury was so severe that his body kind of seized up and his hands went into this like gruesome motion and the camera just zooms right in. Did anybody watch this? The camera zooms right in on his like body being disfigured. And the camera stays there. And I saw, some, I saw a video in which some NFL players were like, why do they keep showing it? Stop showing the replay, that's grotesque. But why did they? I mean, think about that. Why did they keep showing that? Why were people fascinated with that moment, with that grotesque bodily posture and a brain injury and somebody maybe dying on live TV? Turns out he didn't die. Turns out he was, you know, not okay exactly, but he went home with his team and he was discharged from the hospital. But he was carted off in a stretcher. So it's kind of like a fascination with this kind of violence, even as we, re even as we represent it in, in non-literal non formats, although I guess football is kind of a literal violence format, but people aren't supposed to die exactly, okay. But here's something to know right off the bat, and this is a big level thing. In the biblical vision, violence is not natural or normal. In the biblical vision of creation, God creates a world that is good, and in the garden environment, like the ideal situation, there is not violence. We don't have a lot spelled out in that text. I don't know if that exactly means that, like, they didn't chop down trees, because, like, is chopping down a tree a kind of violence? Or, I mean, Adam is supposed to be a tiller of the soil. If you till the soil, are you doing violence to the ground? Like, I don't know how far to stretch the word violence exactly. But I do know that there's a picture of harmonious people living together without bloodshed. And that image of people living together like that in a garden actually comes back, comes back in, in a beautiful full circle, again, plot spoiler, in the book of Revelation, where that garden is restored to people. So in the biblical vision, it's not simply a cycle of violence. There's a beginning and there's an end, and that beginning and the end are the same, and it is, and it, and it is a nonviolent world. So violence in the biblical vision, I, I think for Christians, I mean, this is something we could think about and talk about, is not natural, is not normal. It might feel like it is, but it's not. So that was my thought number one. Okay, let's get a little more specific. Thought number two. I want us to think for a, a second about ambiguous story violence versus God-commanded violence. This doesn't, this doesn't solve the problem at all, but it helps us separate out kinds of violence that we might read about and helps us think about what we're seeing. So the story in Judges 19 that I narrated, that, that really horrible, truly horrible story of violence, of violence against women, of, of people mixed up in all kinds of bizarre behavior, it's a story that's clearly pre presented in the genre that it is, a narrative, as a narrative. And you're left to wonder, perhaps even hauntingly, what God is supposed to think about that. Now, in the history of readership of that story, I have never met a reader, and probably it would be hard to find a reader, who would read that and think that the narrator is suggesting that God thinks that that's great, that that's supposed to be what's happening. In fact, I think there are pretty clear clues in the book of Judges that this is a narrative of a mixed-up world. It's kind of like this wild frontier era of Israel's history, you might say, before they had a king. And there's a sort of thesis that the author has, as you think about writing essays as college students, always have a thesis, I guess. Uh, the Book of Judges has a kind of thesis, which is like, without a clear authority structure, people will slip into obscene acts of violence. And the book makes that really on the nose at the end of the book by repeating this line like four times in the last three, four chapters of the book. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Which I think is a pretty clear representation that like they're saying, we don't have a righteous king. Um, the spirit of God can help people in limited scenarios, but ultimately, um, these are the kinds of things that happen when we don't have a righteous leader on the throne, right? So what is the text then in Judges 19 promoting? Not rape and murder and dismemberment, we react in horror. We see the worst of what people have to offer. And I don't want to minimize the trauma or the drama or the violence of that story by saying it that way, but I think it's, despite the blunt shock effect of a story like that, it would be important to recognize that the narrator is not presenting this as an ideal world or a good world. In fact, the narrator seems to be presenting it as the culminating argument in what a truly horrible world is like in that time, right? What about, though, okay, there's that. <laughs> and there are other things like that, too. A lot of the wars that you see and just, you know, sort of vile acts of violence you see fall into this category. So I, I think it is truly important as a sensitive reader to separate that out from another category, which is divine commanded violence. God commands it. It's harder to deal with it because you can't explain it away so easily. Granted, 
You could, I mean, you, in a very ethereal kind of sophisticated move, you could draw this kind of violence into the realm of the ambiguous story violence by considering God as a character in the narrative and then relativizing God's place. It's a difficult move. I'll come back to it. Many Christians wouldn't accept it. You'd just be like, well, if God is saying it, like, and if I can't trust that the God in the story is like the real God, what am I supposed to think? Um, whatever the case, whatever the case, as a first move, we need to be a careful reader and we need to hang in there with some stuff even when there seems to be God-commanded violence. And let me give this example. Now, this example does not solve the problem of the harem, the, the, the ancient Near Eastern warfare practice that Israel practices in Deuteronomy and then also in Joshua, but it does at least offer a frame for us to think about how we're supposed to read a command in a story like that. So here's the simple narrative. God says, go and, and like basically ethnically cleanse the land of the Canaanites of this particular people group, the Canaanites. And it sounds like, kind of like, I mean, a little bit like, you know, like a genocide. That's what a genocide is, right? You, you try to eradicate from the earth a particular group of people. So that's like truly weighty. I mean, this is a truly problematic moment in Scripture, potentially, even if you buy into the idea that God commanded it. But there are some details here that one would have to consider. For example, um, in Joshua chapters 12 and 18, and this is very detailed, but hang with me here, okay? In Joshua chapters 12 and 18 and 21, we get, we get what seems to be a statement that they really did carry this out, that this was God's command and they really did do it. However, Joshua chapters 13 and 17 very explicitly suggests that there was land that remains that they didn't actually do it. So how can they do it completely and then also not do it at the same time? Like, what is Scripture saying here exactly? In Joshua chapter 2, which I know you were all talking about in your small groups this week, you had Rahab. So there were some Canaanites, actually, that had a different faith. And in fact, it wasn't actually just Rahab, was it? It was her whole family. It was this extended group of people. So, all right, not quite totalizing. We also have this odd scene in Joshua chapter 5, right on the eve of battle, where an angel of God appears to Joshua, the captain of the army. And Joshua's first question, which is a natural warlike question to ask, which is like, whose side are you on? Namely, like, you better be on our side, right? And, or are you on their side? And the angel famously says, I mean, in Hebrew, actually, he says, lo, which is the word no. <laughs> Whose side are you on? The answer is no. So it's like, I guess, neither? He's saying neither. I'm not on anybody's side. Okay, well, how can you have a form of warfare like this? I mean, aren't you, isn't this about sides? How's that supposed to work? Next point in this roll call of points, even great victories like Joshua 7 are marked by moral failure. So right after they do this great Conquest of Jericho, it's like the Sunday school story, they march around. Um, one of the characters in the story actually violates this idea that they're not supposed to take any gold, not supposed to take any silver, not, not supposed to leave anything living. It's violated right away, and then that guy is punished, and then there's something like a harem which is done on him and his family. So apparently this is something that can swing in a lot of different directions. So that's a little odd. Then, in the beginning of the book of Judges, I realize you weren't asked to read these chapters, but you can take my word for it and read it later. Actually, don't take my word for it. Read it later, but I'll, I'll tell you in advance. There are actually three reasons given by the narrator there for why Israel did not do the harem in full on the land. The first reason is that Israel sinned. They were supposed to do it, and they didn't. That's straightforward. Okay, I get that. The second reason, though, a little more ambiguous. It was that God wanted there to be people left in the land so that there would be a test for Israel so that they would know whether they'd be faithful for God or not, a kind of divine test. Okay, well, if God wants there to be a divine test, why did he command them to eradicate all the people out of the land to begin with? So that's, you know, how do you deal with that? Then there's actually a third reason, which is that the people in the land were left there intentionally in order to teach Israel warfare. So these reasons start to sound like they're drifting more toward the people were always maybe supposed to kind of be there. So what's happening here, right? My point is similar to, and I realize as part of your homework for this week, you were asked to watch a Bible project video, and they actually address this too, this issue of, of the harem in Joshua. And they say, because of stuff like this that I'm bringing up, you would maybe read the story as not literal, like it's not a literal tale, but it's some different kind of story. Okay, I want to come back to that, because that's actually a complicated point that could be right or it could be wrong. But my point here is that the statement God commanded a full genocide and Israel carried it out is actually contradicted within the Bible itself. So we're going to have to come up with a, a style of reading scripture that is big enough, that is capacious enough, that is mature and adult enough to be able to handle something like that. And a simplistic, like maybe a simplistic, literal, straightforward reading isn't actually big enough to handle a situation like that. 
There's also the case, by the way, I shouldn't even bring this up, but you know, I'll do it anyway. On, on a kind of Indiana Jones history and archaeology level, we have some suggestive evidence, it's not perfect, that these events in this conquest, there's no, there's no archaeological evidence for some of it. So if they're supposed to wipe out Jericho, for example, what if there was no archaeological or historical evidence that Jericho was even a city at that time? or that it existed or that it even had these huge kind of walls. Archaeologists actually do debate that kind of thing. So if that were true, that would actually add another layer of problem here too, like what is the genre? I know we've been talking about genre in this class, but like is, does the word narrative mean history? Did you just assume the word narrative meant history? Because history is actually a pretty specialized type of subgenre within narrative. How would you know what is history and what is not history? Okay. Okay. Let me offer and this will more or less be my conclusion here, and then we'll move to a conversation if that's something that you want. Let me move to two, two theological explanations people have given for violence. So I've offered two broad ideas. One is that you know, violence in the biblical vision is not normal, is not natural, and it's, it's a kind of a temporary sinful phase of fallen humanity. Number two, we would want to distinguish between maybe what we would say the, quote, easier cases to deal with. They're not actually easy because it's still hard, but cases where this, where scripture is not exactly promoting the violence, but rather it's showing truly dark humanity at its darkest. And we know what that's like, and we deal with that in a mature way when we watch TV shows that have violence. We don't always assume it's being promoted, or when you play a video game like a first-person shooter game, you know, it's not like, oh, I'm going to go out and shoot somebody now, right? You have a way of dealing with this, right? So I'm suggesting you would apply that same kind of wisdom and discernment to scripture, too, where things can be depicted, but they're not exactly promoted. But it gets harder to deal with when you feel like, you know, you're reading and it's like God commands it. Now, here are two ideas that people have, have come to. They're, they're different ideas. I'm not saying you couldn't do a mashup of both. I'm not saying that either one of these is better than the other. But they're two, two approaches. Here's the first one. You can choose a theological core. I'm going to call this the theological core idea. I don't really know what to call this, but that's my best shot. Theological core. You say to yourself, ah, Scripture must have some, some lighthouse, some, something I can look to to help me organize this violence, even the God-commanded violence, because it's truly too terrible, and I don't know what to do with it. You could do worse, for example, than to choose the person and teachings and life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ as your theological core. And you could say, ah, Jesus offers himself up willingly to violence. As God, presumably, as people taunt Jesus about this very thing on the cross— Jesus could have presumably like, called down angels and rescued himself from this act of senseless, horrible, unjust violence that he suffers on the cross. He doesn't. Why? Maybe you look at that and you say, ah, actually, this is God himself in the person of Jesus Christ, the incarnate God, judging the world's violent traditions and looking backwards, backwards on even the whole Old Testament world and all of Israel's history and saying, nope, that is not the way to live. There's a different way to live and we're bringing all of this violence to a head. We're bringing it to a close right now in, in, uh, in favor of a new era and a new way of thinking. So what you then have is a kind of system where you have Bible that's kind of like working against Bible. You have Bible and anti-Bible. You have scri some scripture which is then kind of like um, overridden or read in light of other scripture. And if that sounds like a controversial, strange move, it, it might be. But it's maybe not as controversial and strange as it sounds at first glance. There are major theological figures who have done this. Martin Luther comes to mind. Martin Luther, the Protestant reformer who, who broke away from the church as he knew it uh, in his time in the 16th century, he had, he had a kind of rule like this. And the rule was called, he thought that scripture was that which preaches Christ. And not all scripture preached Christ in the same way, or even at all. It even led to him actually taking some whole books of the Bible and saying, those books shouldn't even be in the Bible because they don't preach Christ. Or even taking some sections of books that could remain in the Bible and saying, those, uh, those parts don't preach Christ. So in other words, he had a kind of a rule, an interpretive framework for which he could do this. So it has some pros to it. It has Jesus at its center. It has some cons too, some drawbacks. It could be too complicated. You could be like, geez, that sounds complicated. Like, how am I supposed to know which, you know, what's the view of scripture here? Is it simply taking passages that I don't like and throwing them out? And if you pit Jesus' teaching too hard against the Old Testament, you know, that's kind of dangerous too because then you make it look like Jesus is not continuous with the God of the Old Testament, which is an important scriptural and theological point too. So how far do you want to try to sever that? But you could go with a theological core. You could also go with a, I don't know what to call this one either, let's just call it um, violence as righteous justice. You could embrace the Bible's violent traditions and go the total opposite direction. And you could say, oh, hey, 
I love justice, and because I love justice, you need judgment in order for justice to occur. This is where you'd get into readings, um, which I think have been very popular among some Christians, like, hey, the Canaanites, these were not great people, okay? They deserved it. Cleanse them, absolutely. If God said it was right to do, it's right to do, and you embrace it. The question is, can you embrace that kind of view with the sort of nuance and love and charity that you would need to do in order to fulfill Scripture at other points? So you could, you could still be sensitive and lament the destruction that comes from even God's righteous judgment, but it raises a sort of disturbing question, which is like, if you really think it's God's righteous judgment, why would you lament it at all? You'd just be celebrating it. And there are some difficult and strange interpretations of this harem that I've heard that actually lean so far into this that they make it sound as though, you know, God even really likes it when, like, young children are killed. And even that might have been an act of mercy for the young children, because then they could just go straight to heaven and not have to grow up in this depraved culture. Well, you know, do you, is that a kind of reasoning that you want to apply to other things? Like, do you want to apply that to the world today? I mean, do you ever want to say people are truly without hope? It seems like a very strange way to do it. So it could, that, that approach could lead you in unfaithful direc uh, directions, which we could talk more about if we want. Let me close with this statement. All of this raises a big issue that I think we're in process of figuring out right now, and so if this feels unsettled or unfinished, it's because it is unsettled and unfinished. In fact, this is one of these topics, I was just talking to another biblical scholar about this recently, and we were like, this is a topic for which there is no good solution. <laughs> like, everything that you say just feels wrong. Even as I stand here saying it, it's like, yeah, but there's that, but there's that, but there's all this nuance to that, and then that sounds wrong, and then that sounds wrong. Okay. Um, but, one place we could go in this discussion, as, as, as you grow and mature in faith, is that you begin to develop what we might call a theology of Scripture for yourself. A theology of Scripture. A theology of Scripture is like an overarching, kind of like an overarching philosophy, mission, framework, into which you put really hard examples. It's kind of like, a, it's, it's like your own understanding theologically of how the Bible is true. Not just enough to say the Bible is God's word or the Bible is true, but rather... A, a, a statement about how the Bible speaks as God's inspired word, a statement about how the Bible is organized and about how it's to be read. And I know you're like, yeah, well, that's the question, right? I'll make two suge suggestions to close here, and then I'll kick it over to Dr. Mayward for whatever he wants to, to do or where he wants to go with this. But how would you get this theology of Scripture, scripture this framework into which you would put all these kinds of hard questions? Two things. Number one, you would do it in a church or something almost exactly like a church, you would do it in a community where you had other people for God to speak through them and into your life and call you to be responsible to Scripture. That's one way you would do it. And you also have to do it by actually reading the Bible. You actually have to read Scripture. It's, it's a good time, I think, in your life as an adult, as a growing adult, to have a little bit of a gut check about what you say you think the Bible is. Like, oh, I believe the Bible is like God's inspired word. It's like a letter God wrote to humanity. That's beautiful. I believe that too. Oh, have you read the Bible? Have you read the whole Bible? Well, I've read like 1% of the Bible. <laughs> it's like, okay, so God wrote you a letter. God wrote a document for humankind. And you're like, yeah, I'll get around to it someday. You know, and you read like one chapter a week or something. Probably isn't enough, right, to make that work. Like, you really would have to get serious about this. So this isn't something that's going to come cheaply for us, I think, as believers. But it's something that's going to unfold as we get wiser and more sophisticated as people of faith in our lives. All right. I used up way more time than I thought I was going to, to even get to that point. So I'm going to pause it right here. Just pause. We're not done. Just a pause. Take a breath. So if you have a question or thought, you can type that in. Use the code 88429775 and ask a question. But in, before we do that, actually, just take a second. Turn to someone next to you, having taken a deep breath. Dr. Doka has given us a lot to ponder What's one thing you're holding on to or one point that stands out to you right now? It's like, hmm, that's either a major takeaway that I'm going away with or mm, a lingering concern or thing I'm not sure I fully agree with. So something, something you might take away right now, something you might disagree. Go, turn to someone next to you, tell them what that is. <laughs> Give me a sec to do Okay, okay, I'm cutting back in on you guys here. You can keep talking or whatever. I'll just talk over you. I've got the microphone, okay? I'm going to the screen right here. Um, this is from the Mentimeter. Why do you think God would not just kill the people who were living in the promised land rather than giving it to the Israelites? Um, okay, 
So I guess in the, in the option proposed here, it would be like God would come in, wipe out the people in the land, and then don't give it to the Israelites. And just be like, this is my land. Don't touch my land. Is that the idea? I'm not sure. Why do you think God would not just kill the people who are living in the promised land rather than giving it to the Israelites? Um, I don't know. I think, well, for some mysterious reason, in God's promise to Abraham, that's part of the early narrative in Genesis, he promises Abraham and Sarah, both of them together, that they're going to get two things, that they're going to get land and kids. Land and kids. And it ends up being two things that are a huge problem for them because they can't have kids, number one. And then also they're, Abraham leaves his land that he was to inherit from his father, so he doesn't have that. So this is part of a big structure that's going on in the story at this point, like bigger level. He's going to give them land. So he wants them to live in the land. There's something sacred or holy about the land, about the place um, that God wants to give them, and he wants them to be there. Maybe this is why the angel in, in Joshua chapter 5, when asked, whose side are you on, says no. It's almost like God is on God's side. God is on the side of the land and the place. And even when Israel disobeys, God's going to do the same kind of punishments to them that he does to the Canaanites. In fact, I'll even take this a step further and say, a little bit unrelated to the question, but I'm going there, that, I mean, all this stuff, okay, I realize the Bible Project videos, they say something that I don't love in those videos. And, and those videos are great. I know who those people are who made those. Like, it's, they're really smart. But here's something I think is a little bit of a problem. When they say, well, you know, truly the Canaanites, they're kind of bad people. Like, for instance, they practice child sacrifice. It makes it sound as though Canaanites are just sacrificing children on every street corner. I, the Bible doesn't really present that as a picture of the Canaanites. They do mention child sacrifice. Um, but we don't really have archaeological evidence of that, like giant pits of, you know, murdered children during the biblical period. So we don't know, is that, is that an exaggerated thing, or is that real, or what is that? And by the way, Scripture actually says that the Israelites practiced child sacrifice at points. By the way, do you remember a story from last week when God actually asks someone directly to sacrifice their child? By the way, plot spoiler, the idea of child sacrifice is embedded into one of the deepest theological ideas of Christianity, namely the idea that God allows his only son to go to the cross. So like, what, like, how are we supposed to understand that? And there are these very, you know, kind of very suggestive verses in the Bible about the status of the firstborn son and the value of the child, and it's, it's a big drama, actually. So I'm not totally convinced that you could just take something like that and be like, well, they forfeit the land because, you know, child sacrifice and other probably weird, depraved things that they were doing. Israel apparently does those things too, and then, by the way, God punishes Israel, another plot spoiler, later in the plot for doing those exact kinds of things. So God really does seem to care about the land. Why doesn't he just leave the land alone? I don't, I, I, I don't really know. I, maybe I didn't interpret that correctly. Okay. If we assume violence as righteous justice, okay, that option. I don't know if part of it is being blocked by the pop-up there. Why would God allow imperfect people to carry it out and get carried away instead of his own perfect judgment? Asteroid. Love the asteroid idea. <laughs> that's, that's, very, that's fascinating. Yeah, and I mean, presumably if you're God, you could just have people, you wouldn't even actually need an asteroid. You could just have the people drop dead or just disappear you know, from the earth. Um, I truly do not know why, except to say that there is, there is some kind of pattern. Actually, this is something to notice about the Bible in general. This is like Genesis 1-1 and onward. Do you notice that the Bible never gives us a backstory of God? Like, the Bible has no prequel. Like, what's the prequel to the Bible? Like, when is God running around doing things, like, out in the universe with other gods? Everything God does is in relation to people in the Bible. I mean, overwhelmingly. And so this pattern that God works with the world and works with people is, I think, a theme that you could really trace as you do your reading. Like, how is God dealing with imperfect people to carry out God's plan? And in fact, that plan of God's involvement with people um, in the world, even people who can break down, people who can die, people who fail, people who cry, people who have hunger and thirst, that, that comes to a culmination in the person of Jesus in the New Testament when God gets arguably as involved as a God could get with people by becoming a person but also remaining God, I mean, it's kind of confusing. But So, I don't know. Where is Jesus in all this? How do you relate this to Christ, and how should we live our own lives? I know. So that was my idea with the theological core. It's like, where is Jesus in all this? Jesus is like, he is the crucified Savior. He is the one who, even after his resurrection, has these nail wounds in his hand. He, is, he suffered, and it was real. That's where Jesus is, okay? So in that option, at least as I suggested it, you could take this image of the crucified Christ or the Jesus who in the Sermon on the Mount in the book of Matthew says, you know, if, you're, if a person, you know, wants to take your, take your jacket, give it to him. If a person asks you to walk with him, do it. Don't, you know, you got to love your enemies. And Jesus is, in fact, judging this whole tradition. My point there, though, is like, you got to be careful when you go with that route 
Because if you start to do this thing where you're like, Jesus, Jesus, okay, the Old Testament's confusing. Hey, guys, it's like 76% of the Bible by volume is the Old Testament <laughs> before Jesus arrives on the scene. So if you think that that shouldn't have been there or you judge it too hard, it's like, is God a bad author of the Bible? Like, why did he waste our time with 76% of a really long book if it was just supposed to culminate in this one guy who technically, you know, saves us from our sins or something like that? So the, the suggestion there would be that it's something deeper than that. It's something more meaningful. How you do it, though, you know, that's open to question. So Jesus is there. Um, how's the supposition there was no violence in the Garden of Eden supported in the text? If there was microbiology present, then there was assuredly violence. No. Yeah, this was my, I started to get into this, like, I, even as I said it, I was like, yeah, but what about, like, chopping down a tree? Are you, like, killing little small things, and is there death there? That's a great question. I don't feel like I'm smart enough totally to answer that, except to say that there is no narrated violence, and I think that the text doesn't engage with questions like that but assumes that these people are living in some kind of world which is free of this sort of competition and blame and so on. So I'm, in other words, I'm just taking the story at, at face value, you might say, after, after this problem they have with the snake, which is not a problem with violence, uh, of violence, but the violence comes in after that. So violence is secondary. Cain kills Abel. That's the first recorded act of violence. Um, but animal violence and things being killed, that's a great question. How do we deal with Christians who justify holy war, for example, the Crusades? I know, super huge problem, right? Because Christians on the model of scripture itself, have said, yeah, if God wanted the Israelites to do war in the past, why wouldn't he want us to do war today? I mean, how is scripture a model for our lives if we can't actually use it as a model for our lives? Which, again, another, another beef with the Bible Project thing, they sort of sweep the book of Joshua aside and say, this was a one-time, unrepeatable act, just God commanded it, just kind of like put it in a glass case and look at it like it's in a museum. Um, and maybe, I mean, I, I guess I kind of feel good about that. I mean, I, I hope that that's true. I mean, that feels right. But... Um, people have been very convinced that, in fact, God has wanted them to carry out acts of warfare. Um, I guess one question to ask yourself, and this is a question I ask myself, too, especially in these politically uh, argumentative times that we live in, is like, is my opinion that God just, it just coincidentally, I'm being sarcastic, that God just coincidentally happens to agree with all of my political and geopolitical opinions and wants the people killed, just coincidence that I want killed? It just so happens. It's like, hey, I've just lined up behind God, and it turns out God has lined up behind me. When we think like that, you have to ask yourself whether you're committing one of the primal sins of the Bible and of the Christian tradition, namely idolatry, making yourself into God or turning something else into a God. I mean, the acts of the Crusades and other holy wars have struck me as huge acts of, of idolatry and of, um, you know, just profane violence. Um, but admittedly, so I'm offering another, another viewpoint, though. Admittedly, people are taking Scripture as a model for the kind of thing they might do, and it's hard to know when to do that and when not to do that, except if you had a theological core, like Jesus' commands about, say, nonviolence or something like that. That's not a perfect answer to that, by the way. How has your perception of God changed with this particular story of the Bible? Um, I don't know which story that, that, that you mean, but if you mean all of the violence, I guess it's led me to a very, I don't know, like throughout my adult life, it's led me to some very dark places, you know, in terms of faith, like, God, is this really what you wanted? What do you want now? It's made me very cautious as a reader of scripture. I hope sometimes maybe in a bad way, but I hope not in a bad way, where um, I kind of, you know, I'm somebody like, I'm a sucker, this is the last thing I'll say, I'm a sucker for clickbait. Do you know what clickbait is? Like when you see an article and you're like, here's the one food you need to eat. And I'm like, dang it, take my click. What is the food? I want to know what it is, right? I think that these kinds of stories have led me in my own personal spiritual journey to be like, faith is not like a clickbait thing. It's not like, here's the one solution to violence in scripture. Here's the solution to the problem of evil. And I sort of get nervous um, when, when I want those kinds of solutions, those kind of consumer solutions in really detailed, complicated adult areas of my faith. So it's, it's led me into some deeper waters. I guess that's what I can say. Okay. Thanks for those questions. I know there were probably Give more Give it up too. for Brian Doak. It's complicated, right? The text, the questions. But if we get anything out of this, two things I want to highlight. Number one, being a careful reader of the whole text, not just picking and choosing and cherry picking and being like, oh, this one verse and outside of its context. No, reading the whole text matters, being a close, attentive reader. And the second thing, that theology of scripture idea, having a more robust understanding of what is this text? What does it mean and how do I understand it and how do I enter into a story or tradition that helps me understand that is also significant. 
It's a huge part of what we're doing in this class, is trying to wrap our minds around why this text matters and how we understand it. This video podcast is a production of George Fox Digital. To find more material like this, you can subscribe to George Fox Talks on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you listen to podcasts. Our team really appreciates your feedback in the form of likes, comments, and reviews, and we'd really love to hear what you think. To sign up for our weekly email list and to keep up to date with the latest episodes and publications, you can check us out on the web at georgefox.edu talks. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode.